Okay, hello and welcome to the Frontier View uh, webinar on APAC Digital Customer Engagement Strategies. I'm Sarah Gunnis, Managing Director of Client Services Asia Pacific. Uh, before we get started, uh, we realize that some of you may be new to Frontier View, so we'd like to take a minute to provide you with a very quick overview of our firm and how we work with executives at major multinationals. Uh, Frontier View provides the world's best market intelligence and advisory services for global business professionals. We help our clients grow and win in their most important markets by informing and powering the market monitoring, planning, execution, and other critical decision processes of our clients. With continuous research and insights, custom solutions, and transaction support services, we provide our clients a small sample of which you'll see here, with timely, actionable insights to adapt and win in changing markets. If you are not a client and interested in receiving complimentary access to our Frontier View pro program, uh, please leave a comment in the chat box or email us at info at duckerfrontier.com. As part of our offering, we're very excited to announce that we have recently launched a new mobile app, uh, Frontier View Mobile, uh, which is available both on iOS and Android, include all the relevant content you need to monitor your markets, um, including this webinar recording and presentation deck. We encourage you to download the app if you haven't already and access these insights uh, and as well as more at your fingertips. Uh, current clients can access the mobile app using the same login information as our browser application. If you're not a client, you can still download the app and start monitoring up to five complementary countries and access other features like daily news and notifications. Uh, having briefly introduced our company, I'd also like to take a moment to introduce our presenter. Today we have Martina Bozadjieva on the line for today's call. Uh, Martina is our head of global research at Frontier View, and she will be sharing insights on how COVID-19 is impacting the adoption of digital strategies for healthcare companies. Because Martina is in constant contact with our clients, she will be discussing not only the results of our research, but also what we've been hearing from multinationals who are being impacted by the coronavirus. If there are any insights you see today as part of this discussion, or any questions we don't get to answer, our client services team, Ravine, Althea, Yuchen, and myself will be very happy to follow up with you directly. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn things now uh, over to Martina to take us through the presentation and agenda. Great, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you everybody for joining us this, uh, this afternoon. Um, today, what I'll share with you is some of the insights that we've gathered from our client base as well as our research around how companies in the healthcare space are reshaping their digital stakeholder engagement strategies. I will also be sharing some benchmarking information uh, from prior surveys we had conducted on this topic. But because we know things are moving fast in the world of COVID and we wanted to get a sense of how the group which has joined us today is feeling about this issue, we will also be doing some live polling, which um, will pop up on your screen whenever the question is ready, and we'll just ask you to click on a specific answer. Uh, the results of that are anonymous and will be aggregated, but you will be able to see them the moment that we complete the polling. So it will be a live way of getting a sense of how the rest of the audience um, is feeling about this, and uh, we'd appreciate it if you could share with us um, answers to some of the polling questions. With that, what I'd like to start with is uh, actually a series of definitions because there's often so much uh, complexity in talking about digital transformation, digital engagement, especially in the context of the healthcare space where there's uh, regulation that makes this even more complex. A, a lot of times we see companies that have a very broad ranging digital agenda and in many cases that includes uh, transforming internal processes using digital tools, whether that is automation, whether that is by using data and analytics across the you know, organization, across different functions. We're also seeing um, uh, uh, digital uh, tools, so uh, transforming people management, but that is not the focus of our conversation today. In fact, what we want to focus on a little bit more is stakeholder engagement. And there are two components to that, uh, the way that we think about it. First, you have digital solutions. Um, and the, the purpose of these solutions, and we see a lot of companies, especially in the med tech space, in the diagnostic space, bringing those to market is to enable um, their uh, stakeholders to be 
using uh, the products better or to be getting much more detailed information or to improve uh, diagnostic accuracies. There is a number of digital solutions that are being brought to market and that is uh, really only accelerating over the past several years. Uh, and of course, in some cases, those are used to also provide stakeholder support, for example, for healthcare professionals. That is a big and complex topic because there are big questions about both the regulatory element of them as well as how they're monetized. And it will not be the focus of our conversation today. However, if you are working on a question around monetizing or bringing to market your digital solutions in the healthcare space, drop us a note, let us know. Uh, we have materials that we can share and uh, we certainly can support you and your teams in those internal um, uh, conversations. Where we will focus today, and more specifically, is on the other component of digital stakeholder engagement, which is around the communication and marketing side, um, including bringing awareness, whether it's to a therapy area or to a particular disease, influencing stakeholders, advocating. And uh, we've seen a lot of activity in this space uh, translate from offline to online as a result of COVID-19. So what I will first start by doing is giving you a sense of what companies that we speak to in the healthcare space have been doing in transforming their digital marketing activities uh, in the world of COVID, which has been extremely disruptive across a number of normal activities that companies engage with, uh, including uh, their own sales activities and engagement uh, with healthcare professionals, with hospital administrations, uh, administrators, et cetera, um, as well as the ability to hold or, or uh, attend conferences, um, as well as other factors. Essentially, anything that is in person, of course, has been much more difficult to do. And so we've seen quite a lot of innovation uh, from companies in the healthcare space in trying to adapt to this quite unusual environment. I will walk you through some examples of this, and then we'll come back to the group and ask a couple of questions about how you have been doing this in Asia, what's been working, what's not been working. And this will take us into the bigger strategic questions about not only how do we uh, move things to digital while COVID is disrupting our ability to be physically present, but actually how does that fit into the broader offline online mix in terms of stakeholder engagement. So if we look at the four broad categories of problems that COVID has created, and we look at uh, what companies have done, uh, first, there's been a very clear disruption to the ability to send sales reps into hospitals or physicians' offices. And so what we've seen companies doing, of course, is moving those to video conferencing, uh, being more flexible on uh, the time to engage and looking for a little bit of flexibility around uh, that, as well as using social media. So doing things that are maybe a little bit less um, in the moment, but keeping in touch uh, with the key stakeholders in order to maintain that relationship. Um, that makes sense, um, but there are questions about how and whether it lasts post-COVID-19, especially in countries where a personal relationship, a physical presence is really important for maintaining trust and, uh, and continuing to build on an existing relationship, and especially where building a brand new relationship with someone you don't know really does require that in-person interaction. So there are uh, still lingering questions from the companies that we speak to about whether uh, the, 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 the HTPs, for example, have been happy to engage via video, but actually, do they really want that long-term, or is that something that they did because they had to, but actually they would rather meet in person? Uh, we've also seen HCPs potentially overwhelmed with digital engagement outreach because everybody has been doing this. There have been tons of webinars, lots of content creation, uh, and at some point it can become too much. And so how that balance uh, looks after COVID-19 is an open question that a lot of companies are still uh, trying to uh, figure out. And then finally, we've seen companies also saying, we on our side can do it. We have the resources to transition content online. We've been training our salespeople to do these meetings through video conferencing, but do I trust my distributors to do it? Do they have the tools, the staff and the training to do it well? Especially in markets where the teams might be small or they might be stretched or maybe even internet connectivity is not as great. And so the distributor component to this makes this extra complex. Uh, in executing even during COVID, but certainly as a post-COVID solution, we've heard mixed, uh, mixed feedback from multinationals. If we move on to the second uh, challenge, which has been the cancellation of conferences and other in-person events, 
um, there have been typical solutions, which is to essentially hold webinars and digital conferences. Uh, and you'll see in a moment when I share some testimonials, some companies have been actually very happy with the way these have turned out. Uh, the big question is, is that a model that really lasts? And what is the right balance between offline and online? Because um, while online conferences do work, there is an element of serendipity and chance associated with live meetings and being in a big event uh, with other stakeholders that can't truly be replicated in quite the spontaneous way that you do when it happens in person. Uh, even though, of course, uh, there are differences in cost, the digital conferences have tended to, of course, be uh, much cheaper, more efficient in terms of both execution and also attendees. Um, and so there are some elements of, that make them attractive, but in other uh, contexts, uh, it, it is missing that element of a human, casual human interaction that can be quite important for the success of these events. Uh, a lot of the companies uh, we speak to are looking to evaluate the right mix between online and offline events for 2021, anticipating that there may be some demand returning, maybe later in the year, for in-person events, but probably in a hybrid type of setup, and also trying to assess, is it really worth it? What is the ROI on these events? Um, third, we've also seen uh, key stakeholders being unavailable, whether those are government officials dealing with managing the uh, fight against COVID, whether these are healthcare professionals who have to be uh, supporting patients in hospitals right now. Um, of course, there's been disruption, and uh, in some cases, uh, some healthcare professionals really called in to uh, engage with fighting COVID-19. And so that's made them less available for interaction with sales teams, uh, much harder for distributors to get a hold of them. Um, and so what we've seen uh, healthcare companies do is try to provide content which is useful, but is not happening on their own schedule. It is actually happening on the schedule of the stakeholder. So uh, things that are more around uh, content creation and distribution, whether it's newsletters, uh, whether these are, this is where social media can come in as well, um, ways to provide context and content, but that can be consumed at whatever point is convenient uh, for the key uh, for the key stakeholder. And then finally, we've also seen a um, whole host of disruption to different types of trainings and demonstrations, uh, especially reflected in uh, the medical device and diagnostics world, where uh, being able to demonstrate and train, for example, surgeons in person can be quite challenging, uh, given social distancing requirements. Uh, and this is where we've seen uh, actually the adoption of very uh, cutting edge tools in terms of virtual reality tools, um, recordings of some of these demonstrations that are then uh, cast live, uh, really looking for a way to bring the experience to an audience that is potentially remote. And you'll hear in a second uh, some of the testimonials from uh, companies that have done that. Um, there are actually pretty decent ways of, of doing it online. It is definitely not the same. Um, but we've seen uh, companies really testing approaches that they maybe would not have done so aggressively in the absence of COVID-19. And in many cases, they've seen that some of this actually works. Um, they have seen potentially better engagement, uh, more focus from their attendees, um, and also potentially reaching a broader audience as well because they don't have the physical constraints of the space in which they're doing this. Uh, so this has brought some interesting ideas to the surface, um, especially in the medical device space, which are probably going to outlast um, COVID-19. Uh, the questions will be more about uh, segmenting the ACP world and understanding which ACPs want to actually do things the old way and they're uh, really only comfortable with the physical type engagement uh, here. Which ones are actually very happy to embrace these new tools, are interested in some of the time savings that come with them, and want some kind of hybrid or even purely online. So uh, the, the um, uh, the stakeholder groups might segment a little bit differently than they had in the past in terms of how you run demonstrations and trainings. And that might prompt uh, some new approaches in terms of how resources are used to capture more people in the way that they prefer to, con uh, to consume that content. Um, and of course, there are limits to what can be done virtually versus physically. So we expect that uh, some types of demonstrations and trainings will go back straight to offline as soon as possible uh, because they cannot currently be sufficiently um, well handled 
and experienced uh, using um, online tools. And to give you a little bit of voice of the market of what we've been hearing from some of the companies that we've been speaking with about how they have adopted their uh, outreach as a result of COVID-19 and how that's worked so far. Um, a few quotes here anonymized uh, to protect the confidentiality of the people we spoke with. But uh, first, uh, one company, the medical device space, which essentially wanted to do this kind of demonstration and training uh, that I was just mentioning. Um, and they had to switch it to Microsoft Teams and they also recorded it on YouTube. So what they did is they ran educational sessions for doctors with whom they normally would engage in person um, and ran virtual walkthroughs of surgeries. Uh, they were very pleased with the results of this. They had very good engagement levels and actually a higher number of doctors who attended these overall than they would if this was happening offline. And so digital really allows us to bridge that gap in terms of time constraints and being able to provide valuable content to uh, very time sensitive uh, professionals. Um, and they also in parallel video type discussions with KOLs, essentially as a value added service uh, to um, help ACPs think about how to treat patients during COVID, how to do telemedicine, trying to really think about what do our ACPs need right now as professionals and provide them with the content and the tools broadly understood to support them in this period of time. Um, and the executive that we spoke with on this specific one uh, was saying that from his perspective, hybrid, this kind of offline online model is likely to remain uh, for longer and um, expecting to see a mix between those two approaches being used for their business going forward. So they've been pleased with the results. They don't think virtual can replace everything, uh, but they want to be a little bit more flexible in terms of the tools that they use. Some other executives that we uh, spoke with, um, a few from different pharma companies uh, globally, just to give you a sense of the types of things they feel uh, they have gone well for them. Um, in one talked to us about participating in an online conference, very large online conference, where they actually felt like they got better engagement and more volume of engagement because it was an online conference. Um, and uh, also one executive uh, that we spoke with was very surprised by how um, some of the physicians that they work with uh, were really taking to social media, even social media channels that you don't really associate with um, I guess healthcare information, and that might seem a little bit out of context for this space, but they were actually just using tools to engage with their peers, um, maybe patients and others, uh, and actually it seemed to be working uh, very well from their perspective. So people have seen experimentation that has challenged some of their assumptions about what works and what doesn't. But the big question was raised by this other executive that we spoke with with a global responsibility, who was trying to bring it all together. And she had responsibility across multiple digital initiatives, including digital stakeholder engagement. And her perspective was, we've got 14 teams working on this. We have people globally working on it in every region, but there's a lot of experimentation, which is great. And we want to see that testing and trial and error, and we want to bring those lessons learned to the broader organization, but we don't want to be scattered or piecemeal in our approach. And this is where, I think it's a good moment for all of us on the phone to pull up and, and think about all the testing that we've done during COVID, all the different experimentation and the teams on the ground have been super flexible. What are the things that really need to stay? How do they fit into our overall digital engagement strategy? And how do we make sure that the teams have the tools, the best practices, even the templates and approaches that will make them very efficient in how they use this, as opposed to having different teams discover the wheel from scratch every time that they have to do something. So uh, she was trying to bring a little bit of structure and a strategic approach to this. And of course, make sure that her organization is investing in the skill sets that they need on their team to be able to really do that. So this is taking us into another part of the conversation where we'll talk a little bit about what does this all mean for the broader digital engagement strategy post COVID. But before I do that, I, I would love to ask our first polling question and get a sense uh, from the group that we have on the line, um, how each of you has uh, approached um, uh, digital stakeholder engagement this year. So how has COVID been 
for you, which of these approaches for digital stakeholder engagement um, have you used in 2020? Again, these are anonymous. You'll be able to see the results right away. So as soon as uh, people answer, uh, you'll be able to see how the rest of the group feels about this. But it would be great to see the perspective from, from Asia. Have you done virtual webinars? Have you done uh, online conferences, virtual sales visits, uh, maybe technical trainings, maybe all of the above? We'll take just a couple more seconds to get a few more results in, um, and then we'll take a look at what the group is saying. Okay, so uh, it seems like these are all have all been very popular tools. Webinars extremely popular. Interestingly, virtual sales visits as well, and we might come back to this topic in a little bit, um, as well as trainings. Now, um, this shouldn't be surprising to me or all of you on the phone as well. I think the challenge is if everybody's doing it, how do we get differentiated? How do we make sure that we're not overwhelming uh, stakeholders with the same type of content uh, that they're getting from a hundred different places. So if we go back to the presentation, uh, I think we will move on to that part of the discussion, uh, which is really uh, looking at the uh, bigger strategic question. And I wanted to give you a sense of where things were pre-COVID. So I will be sharing results from a survey we ran before COVID-19, a global survey on this topic. And I think what we'll do is we'll compare those results to some of what the group is saying today, both to get the Asia perspective on it, but also to get the COVID perspective on it um, as well. So uh, when we uh, polled our global healthcare clients uh, earlier on what is the biggest challenge that their company faces in terms of managing its digital marketing initiatives. Um, this was actually the, the thing that really stood out, which is around going beyond experimentation and really building processes around this. That includes measuring ROI, making sure that uh, there's enough resources invested in this, making sure they have the right skill sets, uh, etc. but really being strategic about how these tools are being used. And we think part of the way to approach this is uh, as we think about moving from the old normal, which was more offline in most cases, to the new normal uh, currently this year, which is very online engaged, to finding what that new mix looks like, uh, is really about understanding the um, way in which um, that mix needs to look from the point of view of the stakeholder. And we will talk in a moment about what the stakeholders need and how do we get that information. Um, but um, I wanted to ask one more following question from the group as we, uh, as we move forward before we go into some of the strategic considerations uh, for this. You should all be able to see the following question now. Um, and uh, part of this is about resource investment. Uh, how much is the organization um, actually uh, willing to invest to digital marketing and outreach? And this is specifically for 2021-2022. So this year, of course, uh, there's been a big shift, but what we are interested in is uh, as COVID moves uh, into the past gradually, how much of your uh, marketing spend is likely to be dedicated to digital marketing? Um, spend doesn't always guarantee quality. So we, we need to think about how some of the tools that we can tap into digitally are actually just cheaper. Um, and so uh, volume of uh, money dedicated to them is only part of the picture. But if there's no resource required or really truly specifically dedicated to it, that makes it harder to hire the right people, to make sure that you're producing the right content, et cetera. Um, so if you could select one of the answers so we could see the results, uh, that would take us into um, our next conversation. Okay, interesting. So, so the majority of the group seems to be actually investing quite a lot of money into uh, digital marketing tools. Perhaps that is a shift as a result of some of the success that they might have seen uh, following COVID-19 uh, and following some of the experimentation that we saw um, all of you on the line have done earlier in the year. But it's also a warning. For those who are looking to invest 
a little bit less or maybe haven't actually made a decision around it, what you're seeing here is also your competitors are spending quite a bit more in this area. And so uh, you certainly wouldn't want to be uh, falling behind as more resource moves uh, behind supporting some of these strategies. So if we move on to um, our conversation, uh, one of the things I mentioned is the importance of tailoring to the needs of the stakeholders and thinking about how to spend that resource in the most efficient possible way. Um, that includes segmentation across the different targeted stakeholders with a good understanding of what that customer journey looks like, uh, then choosing the right digital channels through which to engage them. And we've seen lots of different um, types of channels that we have options to do. The question is, you don't want to be doing this very, very broadly uh, and maybe with very low hit rates. You actually want to be very targeted and uh, specific as much as possible based on preferences, historic behaviors, ultimately data. What is the data telling you is the preferred channel? And then, uh, of course, as a result of that, also thinking about what is the right type of content? How do we personalize it? Uh, how do we make sure it is timely, but maybe not too frequent as well? And then ultimately, making sure that we are measuring the return on the investment and are able to recalibrate and be very quick in, on our feet in terms of understanding what's working and what's not, um, and then uh, tailoring further. And we see that cycle, of course, uh, in companies in the consumer goods space who are typically ahead of the game of most other firms in terms of having the data and the tools and the processes for running this. And what we're seeing now is more investment in this in the healthcare space, but of course, coming from a very different perspective, taking into account uh, regulatory uh, constraints on what can and cannot be said and shared with whom, uh, as well as making sure that the quality of the content um, reaches very specific parameters as well. So this takes us into thinking about some of the specific steps we think companies should be taking going forward uh, in order to uh, improve what they have built during COVID and take that experimentation to the next level. Um, and we'll go through each of these questions. We'll do a little bit of life polling throughout as well. Um, and we wanted to provide a bit of a structure around this. So if you are talking to your teams about 2021 planning, and you're uh, discussing with them, how do we make sure that our digital uh, stakeholder engagement strategy is um, not just really reactive and trying to be uh, responding to however the environment is, but is really thinking strategically to position us for the next few years, then uh, these are the areas that we think are important to invest in. First, um, how do you get more detailed information about customer journeys? Um, having that information is becoming more and more critical for a lot of companies, and you'll see not a lot of them have invested in it, at least prior to COVID. Second, uh, how do we select the right tools? We just mentioned the tool selection, but it has to start with the stakeholder first. Uh, third, how do we measure ROI? ROI is a very thorny issue because many companies are struggling to uh, really understand how to quantify that and how to communicate it internally. And lastly but not least is how should the talent strategy evolve to support that mix uh, so that you're really making investments for the long term. So we will go through all of these in order, starting with the um, question around customer journeys and understanding at what point uh, during the day or during a certain engagement process, does the hospital administrator want to be uh, engaged using digital tools versus in person? Uh, at what point does the ACP and how does that customer journey really evolve over time? Where is it appropriate to engage with them using digital uh, digital tools? Um, these are results from, again, the global survey that we ran pre-COVID where we wanted to understand how companies currently collect information about the stakeholder journey so that they inform their digital strategy. So how did they actually get this data? And what you see here, which is interesting, is a lot of it is very qualitative and um, not always at scale. So as you can see, a good chunk of companies are getting that information through general observation. Uh, some are actually doing focus groups, which takes you a little bit closer to having that detailed understanding because you want to know also the nuances of the process. Um, and um, uh, some are also uh, doing various types of um, surveys. 
Um, but it is really scattershot, meaning there are a ton of different approaches. And uh, in many cases, it starts with that general observation. And then there may be some very specific targeted areas uh, which uh, companies are investing in. Understanding which of these methods give you better results and how to create loops. So when you present content, you are able to get enough information from that to then feed back into what your information is about the customer journey and whether that is still accurate uh, is part of the investments in infrastructure and process that we think companies should be making um, in this area going forward. When we ask these companies, they're collecting information through lots of different uh, tools and methods. Um, do they feel happy about this? Are they satisfied with the information that they're able to gather? Um, there, there are gaps in certain types of areas that companies share that they feel they, they have. So the biggest gap was actually probably the most important component of this, which is what is the actual decision-making journey and how do stakeholders use the information that we're providing them with? Um, what does that actually mean? Of course, if you don't have the answer to this question, you don't actually have a full visibility of the stakeholder journey. And therefore, you can't actually influence throughout because you still don't know where your information would fit in. So there are different, definitely gaps in terms of how much information companies are getting that can really inform strategy as opposed to it's interesting but maybe not as actionable. Um, and then similar to this, also gaps in terms of um, stakeholder information that digital marketing can fill. So where you're looking to educate or bring awareness uh, on whatever area you're focusing on, whether it's a disease, a therapy, a new device, etc. cetera, um, uh, knowing what the stakeholders really need in terms of information can help make that content that much more effective. So instead of overwhelming them with tons and tons of materials, many of which may be repeat things they already know, having that data, having that information on uh, where they really have a need for more insights or more technical information can just help you make better use of your resources. So the, there are definite areas where additional in, in, uh, information gathering, additional data gathering from your teams, from your distributors as well, maybe some dedicated uh, surveys as well, especially now post-COVID to understand how has COVID affected these needs and is it different to maybe where it was before. Um, that information can be very valuable in making sure that you're using uh, your tools at your disposal in a way that make them truly effective because then you measure ROI and the ROI gives you the actual uh, results as opposed to uh, maybe more of a scattered type of uh, set of insights. So with this, I would like to turn it back to the group for a moment and ask our next um, following question, uh, which will show up in a second. And in particular, um, we wanted to understand here and now how does your organization plan to get information on how digital engagement fits into customer journeys in the next 12 months? So are you trying to get this information now? Is this part of your plan? Um, do you plan to add questions about digital, uh, the digital engagement preferences of stakeholders um, into broader customer journey mapping that you might be doing for other purposes? Um, do you plan to conduct dedicated customer journey mapping specifically for digital uh, engagement preferences? Do you plan to maybe rely more on information from distributors and sales teams? Um, is, is this part of your plan and how do you plan to approach it? We'll give the group just a minute to respond um, and then we'll see what the results show us. Okay, interesting. And so um, actually a good chunk of uh, the respondents here are planning to do um, dedicated customer journey mapping for this specific area. Um, that I think is a warning to those who are not sure <laughs> or are planning to rely on distributors uh, to uh, get their information because uh, as you are seeing, some of the companies on the line that are joining us today um, are actually able to uh, invest those resources in making sure that they have that right information, pressure testing their digital engagement strategies, looking into next year, 
and making them more tailored. Uh, we have two more questions to ask the group before we go back to the presentation. Um, if we can get the next polling question, and we'll see how it all comes together in a moment in terms of some of the um, areas that we wanted to explore. Um, one thing we wanted to talk a little bit about is where you see a willingness to adopt uh, digital engagement tools on the stakeholder side. So we know culture plays a role, we know infrastructure plays a role, preferences differ country by country. Uh, we've taken just a short selection of markets in Asia. Uh, which is the one that you feel um, stakeholders are most open to digital engagement? Where are they most willing to embrace them as an area of, of um, getting access to your content and insight? Okay, uh, so we'll be able to see the result. Uh, and actually, not surprising, um, we're seeing great openness, or actually pretty strong openness in terms of China, uh, where we know that digital tools of all sorts are uh, being used in extremely innovative ways, frankly, well ahead of anything we're seeing, in, even in Europe, the US, or other parts of the world. So China really leads the way here. And I think this data will be helpful to show to any global executives that we speak to uh, to give them a sense of just how far ahead that market is. Uh, and of course, we also have um, uh, some uh, executives who have pointed to Australia uh, is also uh, being very open to this. Uh, that all makes uh, perfect sense. And then final question before we move on from this section, um, if we can switch to that one too and get a sense from the group about um, uh, which of the below are likely to be at least 50% digital in your region after COVID-19. So thinking long-term about that mix between online and offline, um, which of the below, and you can choose as many as you like, do you think is likely to actually move a little bit more into the online type of mix? Um, is it presentations and webinars? So things you might have done in person with visits, or small groups in person, moving to webinar type setups, trainings? Uh, is it any type of sales meeting with new or existing clients? Is it maybe none of the above? You think everything will be a little bit more offline than online um, after COVID-19. So we're looking the next two to three years. How do you expect that mix across the different tools between online and offline to really evolve? Interesting. So it seems like webinars have really resonated well um, across the individuals that we have joining us today. And uh, they have seen, I'm assuming here, because we don't have a chance to really speak to each other right now, that um, there has been good pickup in terms of volume of people attending them, engagement level. Um, and therefore, there is an expectation that webinars are actually a very efficient way to reach a bigger audience and might be a bigger part of overall presentations. Um, interesting also around the trainings. I'm imagining that there are certain types of products where uh, really in-person demonstrations are not as critical. And so there are opportunities to actually be a little bit more um, online uh, there. Um, and not surprisingly, sales meetings with new clients, a little bit less so because um, as we know, building that trust, building the initial understanding and uh, being able to uh, establish a relationship uh, from scratch. This tends to require a little bit more of an in-person relationship. Uh, but this also gives you a sense of the role that your marketing team can play in enhancing the activities of the sales organization, making sure that there is engagement going on and the salespeople can really focus on uh, some aspects of engagement that really requires them in person, the skills that only a person can bring into that conversation um, and uh, overall approaches. So really good opportunities here and frankly quite sophisticated relative to other regions. So we've done these types of conversations in other parts of the world and uh, from what I'm seeing in the results so far, um, Asia um, really seems to be 
uh, really seems to be leading the way. So if we can uh, switch back now to the presentation, I would love to take you to our next uh, section, uh, which is around the right mix of digital stakeholder engagement tools. Um, and uh, I will share with you first a little bit of the uh, way in which we see companies approaching this. Um, and uh, we will also get a sense of how this is working in Asia. Uh, and what the companies on the line are doing. So we'll start with one more polling question. I promise you we don't have too many more left, uh, but I hope you're finding the information uh, from these polls interesting. We'll, you, we'll make sure you have it. So if you wanted to share it internally, if you wanted to circulate it in your organization, you will have the results of this benchmarking survey. But if we can go on to the next question to kick us off in this section, uh, we wanted to understand um, whether uh, you have concerns about the digital marketing content you're currently using in your country or region of uh, responsibility. Um, do you, uh, of, of the weaknesses here, do you feel like maybe your content might be a little bit less differentiated than you would like it to be? Uh, do you feel like it should be more tailored to country-specific dynamics than it is? Or maybe better tailored to specific audience uh, groups? If you could point to uh, one weakness in terms of your digital marketing content, um, what would what would that be? Where do you see opportunity for improvement? We should be able to see the results in just a moment. Okay, interesting. So um, there is a sense, it seems, from the group that uh, the content could be a little bit better differentiated. Um, and also e above even the split in terms of uh, tailoring to both local dynamics, geographically speaking, and also uh, specific audience uh, groups. Uh, frequency doesn't seem to be an issue. So uh, we've got that now, uh, but where the area for um, further improvement seems to be is on the differentiation side. Um, and the, if we can go back to the presentation, um, as a reminder of uh, this conversation that we had a little bit earlier, uh, this is where I think we go back to the importance of that tailoring in terms of the customer journeys, the importance of gathering the information, and it seems like you are investing in getting that information. So I imagine that this group is going to feel a little bit better about the uh, level of tailoring of their digital content maybe a year from now after some of the stakeholder journey mapping that you said you're going to do is actually giving you enough information to be able to do a little bit better, a little bit better tailoring. But the process behind this and making sure that that content is refreshed on a regular basis, especially given how quickly some of your countries are moving, um, is going to be important for just making sure that you're not just doing this one off and you've got great information, but it becomes obsolete, but you have a way of co collecting that um, over the long term and being able to get feedback loop uh, with your stakeholders. Um, to give you a sense of what uh, we've seen on the global level, uh, the types of tools that companies seem to be using, and this is more specific to digital marketing, so it doesn't include webinars, conferences, and some of those things we discussed. Uh, we're seeing a lot of use in terms of uh, corporate websites with information around the product portfolio, as well as information around uh, clinical uh, insights for patients or physicians. A lot of use of um, email lists, social media to an extent, yes. I, I suspect that in Asia there are uh, going to be, there's a lot more innovation that goes way beyond email, but this also gives you a sense that in other parts of the world, um, uh, there is, uh, things are still a little uh, old school, I would say, in terms of the types of tools that companies are using. This is likely to change dramatically, uh, and we would expect to see um, more investment uh, across a broader range of tools and channels, uh, and probably less dependence on email, which we know in some cases, their stakeholder groups and their segments of the stakeholder population that actually do like that as a form through newsletters, for example. But uh, as the generations are changing, you might be seeing more of that shift towards social media, 
uh, messaging platforms uh, and a range of other tools um, the companies have at their disposal. And this links us back to the question around return on investment. How do we measure that? Because looking at all these options and looking at some of the actually quite substantial investment in uh, digital marketing that you all seem to be making, making sure that uh, we are able to demonstrate the results created by this would be uh, really critical. It is one of the biggest challenges that we hear from the global executives that we talk to. Many of them find it um, challenging to define how they think about results in this space and being able to integrate this into overall marketing ROI assessment. Even the standard marketing um, tools can sometimes be challenging to measure in terms of return on investment, digital marketing even more so because the, especially in the healthcare space, you can't really make that direct link between engagement and the commercial result. There's so many more steps and stakeholders involved in the process that you know you're making an influence, but it gets lost in the shuffle. And so this is where we see um, uh, companies measuring certain aspects of uh, digital uh, engagement. But as you can see from the global survey um, here, a good half of them don't actually measure ROI. They are experimenting and they have not gotten to that step of system systematically evaluating the effects of that yet. Um, that is a big untapped opportunity, essentially. Um, as you can see, it can be done because we've seen companies here uh, which are um, capturing it as part of general marketing, but maybe not broken out individually. Um, we see um, some that are measuring engagement targets. That's a very sound way of doing it, especially if you don't feel like you would ever be able ever be able to draw a direct link between um, engagement and commercial metrics, which of course we want to be able to do if we're going to be making investments. But um, uh, it is a pragmatic approach of, of doing it if if you are unable to get that data or the journey is so complex that there is no way to prove cause and effect. Um, the, uh, there are a few companies that we've followed, not a huge number as you can see, that measure RI in uh, direct or indirect relation to sales. They might be linking engagement to conversion rate. That is, again, heavily dependent on the actual purchasing process um, and uh, the, the conversion uh, those conversion rates uh, easier also uh, when uh, working, for example, with private hospitals than if you're going through a complex public sector procurement uh, process. So um, there's still opportunity for some of these practices to spread, but it starts with having some kind of measurement of RI, even if it is all just about understanding uh, engagement engagement levels. Um, in terms of what's hard about this, uh, it seems like, of course, uh, it's very challenging to get the right kind of information. And uh, the global executives that we polled share that for them, uh, it is hardest to um, uh, measure return on investment uh, for social media, uh, which in general is quite challenging uh, to do that for. And of course, this is, these products are very different from the consumer products where you can actually make a direct uh, link to a particular sale. Uh, and overall, um, there is a pretty good mix for even the, one of the more popular ones, which is email, about 30% of the companies said that it's actually very hard for them to, um, to measure return on investment on that. So there's a lot more investment that needs to be made in this. And then when we look at which stakeholders are also uh, most challenging, to uh, measure RI4, um, not surprisingly here to see patients, um, but also tricky with physicians because we know we're looking to engage physicians and we want to, uh, a lot of the digital engagement work that is being done is actually about reaching out to them, uh, making sure that they have the right information, uh, creating engagement points, etc. Uh, the fact that companies find it very challenging to measure digital marketing ROI for physicians, it tells you that there is a gap in the process uh, and the gap in the internal infrastructure for gathering that information and to really being able to create a systematic way of understanding how effectively um, are they engaged. Payers are by nature much more challenging. Um, and so that I think is more understandable, but from a physician perspective, uh, there definitely is an opportunity to um, 
uh, see an improvement there. And what we've seen also is how companies approach this is through small experiments. So uh, two examples here of uh, two companies that we've spoken with who essentially what they did is they did something very targeted and very specific in one area. Uh, company Alpha um, did it in a specific therapy area where it was a market leader and then it wanted to give itself time to see those results play out because the, the commercial process is also much longer in healthcare than it is in other sectors. And then 12 months after, it wanted to be able to demonstrate growth in this specific therapeutic area. Um, in another case, this one is coming from colleagues out in Mexico. Uh, what they did is they tested a digital engagement campaign uh, in one specific city, um, which was um, essentially a low risk type approach. So trying it out in a place, getting a sense of the results, if it doesn't work, it's not a big deal for the overall presence in the market. Uh, and if it does work, it can be scaled. And so that is what they did. Uh, they ran that campaign um, in Lyon. And then 12 months later, they were able to see that there was higher growth there relative to other parts of Mexico and also relative to historical patterns in that city. That gave them ammunition to say, we need resources, we should scale this. Um, and they were able to essentially take it nationally as well. So with this, um, one more following question for the group, um, and uh, it should be popping up on your screens just in a second. Um, and it's really about this issue of return on investment. Um, you've seen the results from the global survey that we did, but in Asia specifically, how do you currently define and measure RI on your digital uh, marketing initiatives? Um, do you uh, not measure it? Is it measured as part of the overall general marketing RI? Do you measure against engagement, uh, specific engagement metrics, as I mentioned earlier? Um, do you measure it in direct or indirect relation to sales through specific benchmarks that you're linking to it, like conversion rate, for example? Or do you maybe have a very complex and sophisticated way of measuring ROI? Which of these is best representative of what you're doing right now? Okay. Okay, so it seems like the group here is actually exactly in line, more or less, with the global survey results that we shared. Uh, currently, about half of the group doesn't measure ROI. Uh, I think looking at the collective input from the survey results we've seen so far, what I'm seeing is more resources invested in digital marketing, actually quite sophisticated investigation of stakeholder journeys. As you're doing that, clearly there's an opportunity to build some kind of metric, even if it's just basic engagement metrics or anything that allows you to then go back to your stakeholders and uh, prove the effectiveness of some of that investment uh, is definitely worth um, spending on and, and putting into, into plans for next year. Um, and then if we go back to the presentation uh, for our final component before we wrap up, um, I wanted to also uh, talk a little bit about talent. A talent is very important because um, we see uh, individuals who might be um, involved in, in offline marketing who are being asked to branch out into digital marketing uh, in the context of, of course, some of the restrictions in terms of what content can be shared from a healthcare perspective. But if we're going to be making these kinds of investments, and we think we'll be doing tons of online webinars, lots of online trainings, even some online sales meetings, the talent component here actually becomes quite important. Um, if we look at how global executives uh, reported their current spend is allocated, actually a good chunk of it was to contract work. So outside agencies that are creating content or they're spreading that content more externally, not a ton of it done in-house. We expect this to change, especially as companies want to take more control over their messaging. And they also have team members that due to COVID have actually learned a lot what tools to use, how to use them, what's working, what's not. We expect that some of that is going to start to come um, uh, back in-house. And uh, we also expect to see uh, questions around what is the right talent to actually drive this for us. We've seen that in other sectors too over time where um, digital engagement becomes more prominent 
bringing people with the right kind of expertise as opposed to making it an element of somebody's job starts to become more prominent. So you can bring somebody who thinks about this strategically and is able to build you um, your approach into something that is more holistic, well-structured, and can scale very quickly, especially if you want to do it not just in one or two countries, but you actually want to take it across the entire region. And so this takes us to our final polling question. You all have been very generous with uh, giving us answers here. And this one is about talent. And uh, wanted to understand in the overall picture that we've built so far, what investments do you plan to make to support your uh, digital stakeholder engagement? This is investments in talent specifically. Do you plan to make new investments in, in people and talent relating to your uh, digital stakeholder engagement strategy? Uh, do you plan to hire or reallocate staff, maybe towards content creation or other aspects of this? Do you plan to invest in better analytics management, bring talent from another region, maybe from the same organization, but somebody who can uh, bring best practices and toolkits to Asia? Uh, do you maybe plan to hire senior staff um, to support a more holistic strategy? Um, does any of these resonate as something that you're looking to invest in in the region in the next year or so? Okay, interesting. Uh, so um, it seems like there's quite a lot of effort to hire or reallocate staff towards content creation uh, and also invest in the analytics. So these are definitely the right investments uh, from the point of view of what companies have reported they're doing right now. I'm also interested in the 30% uh, who are actually looking to hire senior staff. Uh, these are organizations that are clearly looking to invest as well, not just in the creation, but also in the management and the strategic monetization of uh, the digital content creation. So keep an eye out for, for those companies because um, they're also making substantial investments. Um, so with this, I think we are actually very tight on time. Uh, and I would like to pass it over to um, Tara um, and see if there are any closing remarks she wants to make about follow-ups with the group, any final uh, questions or comments uh, before we wrap up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Martina. Great insight shared today. I really appreciate you uh, going through that. Uh, it looks like we're just at the top of the hour. We do have a lot of questions coming through. Um, and so um, maybe we have time for just, just one. Um, just quickly, Martina, uh, one that has come through is, do you see companies training internal talent into digital tools or hi hiring digital talent and training them on healthcare? I think that dovetails very nicely with the last question we just asked. Uh -huh. uh, yes, we've actually had discussions with um, leadership teams on this question, which is better to, to have somebody who really knows your industry, your therapy area, your company, than learning digital tools, or you want to actually bring in somebody who is excellent in digital engagement, maybe bring fresh ideas from other sectors and train them on the content. And uh, what we have heard, at least from the executives we've spoken with, is strong preference for building in-house talent into the skill sets. And, uh, of course, uh, healthcare being very highly specialized, making sure that um, you have people who you trust really understand uh, both the regulatory requirements as well as the um, as, as well as the very specific nature of the business uh, doing digital marketing. So it seems like more of the investment is in training and upskilling local staff. And I think we saw that in the last polling result as well in terms of hiring for content creation or reallocating staff for content creation. Uh, I imagine in many cases that is with that angle of individuals who really understand healthcare or the specific therapy area um, or disease area and being brought in uh, to essentially engage more using digital tools. Thanks, Martina. Well, um, we've we've reached our limit for today's webinar in terms of time. We do have other questions coming through. So if we weren't able to answer them on the line today, we'll be happy to follow up with responses uh, through your client services manager. So everyone will also receive a recording of the presentation within 24 hours, those of you who are on the line. Um, and you can also view the webinar materials as well as much more uh, on our new mobile app. 
which uh, once again we'll just mention is available for download right now on iOS and Android. Um, for once again complimentary access to our suite of resources, uh, data dashboards, monitoring reports, uh, today's webinar um, and presentation, once again please email us at info at DuckerFrontier. Dot com and a member of our team will be in touch. Uh, thanks again, Martina, and thank you everyone for joining us on the line. We look forward to speaking with you again soon. Take care. Have a great day.